Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our session, The Return of Geopolitical Risk in Business, presented by Florida International University professors Edgardo Papachena and Stav Feinschmidt in collaboration with Ivy Exact. My name is Mariana. I am part of the higher education team here at Ivy Exact, and I will be helping to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping items for our audience. First, all attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we do encourage you to engage in the session by asking questions, which you can do using the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Please make sure to use this feature for all the questions you may have for the presenters, while we invite you to use the in-chat feature for sharing any thoughts you may have with the rest of the audience. We will also be having a formal Q&A session, so please feel free to send in your questions throughout the webinar. Additionally, we are recording today's session, so you can look forward to receiving a copy of the recording via email in the coming days. And now I will pass it on to Angel Burjos, Executive Director of MBA Programs at Florida International University. Angel, I think you, you might be muted. Oh, please forgive me. Hi, greetings everyone, greetings. Can you hear me now? Yes. Greetings from Miami, Florida. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We're delighted to be here with everyone today. I am the Executive Director of the MBA programs here at the College of Business and the College of Business is located in Miami, Florida and it is part of Florida International University, otherwise known as FIU, the fourth largest university in the United States with over 57,000 students currently enrolled. We are long been recognized as the business school of the Americas. We are currently ranked number two for international business by U.S. News and World Report, and several of our master's degrees are ranked in the top uh, 15 by either U.S. News, World, QS World Rankings, and America Economia. I am thrilled to briefly introduce our executive MBA program, which is designed for experienced decision makers who want to develop creative solutions to complex business challenges. To succeed in this new era of value creation, our executive MBA program emphasizes developing leaders who are strategic, creative, and tech savvy. Our graduates are recognized for being globally minded, humble, with high integrity, and are leaders who care about profit, process, and people. Our program is 16 months. It features an experience-driven curriculum, including a week-long international residency through our executive MBA consortium for global business innovation, as well as several sessions with a professional executive coach. Now I'd like to switch gear to the topic at hand, which is the return of geopolitical risk in business. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome two of my outstanding colleagues, two of our outstanding faculty members in the program, Saab Feinschmidt, uh, who is an associate professor, and Edgardo Papachena, who is an adjunct professor of strategy and international business here. Briefly, Dr. Stav Weinschmidt is an associate professor and the Knight Ritter Eminent Scholar Chair in International Business at the FIU College of Business. His research interests include institutions and governance, institutional capabilities, and methods in organizational research. His work appears in outlets such as Journal of International Business Studies, Strategic Management Journal, and Administrative Science Quarterly. He is a reviewing editor of Journal of World Business, of World Business and a consulting editor for Journal of International Business Studies. Prior to joining FIU, Dr. Feinschmidt worked with Deloitte in auditing, consulting, and IPO services. Our second speaker today is Edgardo Papachena, Mr. Papachena is CEO of Kani Investments with over 35 years of global business experience and worked in 50 plus countries throughout his career. As a senior partner in PwC and Arthur Anderson, he held various senior executive leadership roles. Ricardo advised multinational companies in North America, Europe, Latin America, and Asia, consulting with C-level executives in corporate and business strategy business model innovation, business and digital transformation, organizational strategy, change management, and mergers and acquisitions. 
He is an adjunct professor of strategy and international business at the FIU Chapman Graduate School of Business. Thank you, my friends, for being here tonight, today. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, uh, Angel. And um, hello, everyone. Um, we are very thankful for the uh, opportunity um, uh, to be here and uh, chat um, with each other and with all of you. And we thank Ivy Exec for, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I think we should just go ahead and, and jump into it. Um, so the topic uh, of the conversation today is the return of geopolitical risk in business. Um, and um, I'd like us to, um, to define what it is, but before we do it, maybe briefly, Edgardo, Tell us why is geopolitics, the topic of geopolitics, um, important to you personally? Well, actually, as Angel uh, described before, I spent uh, over uh, 35 years in the uh, in the business world, both as a uh, uh, strategy consultant to multinationals all over the world, and also then when um, at, at PwC I was a senior partner there and um, as the chief strategy officer for the firm all over the world uh, one of my responsibilities was actually to uh, to manage the firm's uh, geopolitical risk uh, as part of that i had my fair share of uh, negotiating and dealing with uh, foreign governments mm -hmm. some friendly some not so friendly as i always say um, and also now as in my role as uh, ceo of, uh, of an investment and advisory firm i translate geopolitical risks into a into a portfolio positions into investment positions so it's not something that um that um, i i talk about but it's part of uh, what i've been doing for, for a number of different years and it's 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 a fascinating field that as we all can see has become much more relevant over the last a few years um yeah i i think that you know you're you're coming at it from a very practical uh perspective and we're kind of complementary in that sense because um i am interested in geopolitics uh, in my academic research uh because i'm interested in why how multinational companies behave and why some are more successful than mm -hmm. others and uh, i think that uh, over time um it has become uh clear that um we have to study geopolitics in order to answer some of these bigger questions on what strategies work and or don't work for multinational companies and so in other words the role of geopolitics has become much bigger um, in uh, academic research than it than it was before um, just quickly in terms of the format is as you can all see um, the way that we've planned this is um, conversational and so um, instead of kind of having slides or lecturing or talking about stuff we're just going to have a conversation with each other and Q&A &Q back and forth and so on and I think in the process um, hopefully provide some some useful insights to um, to the audience so first thing first Edgardo uh, let us define uh, geopolitical risk we say that geopolitical risk has returned so uh, we should be able to uh, say what geopolitical risk mm -hmm. is, and also, I guess, why has it returned? Yeah. So, um, clearly, uh, geopolitical risk, may, yes, many people, and they, everyone has a different definition. Um, you know, for me, it's very simple. Uh, there's two words, geopolitics and risk, right? For me, geopolitics it has to do with uh, the ability of any country to actually project power. I mean, at, at, the, at, the, at the heart of geopolitics is power. Uh, power usually leads to conflict uh, because countries project power uh, in pursuit of their national interests, right? Uh, so that's that's a, a, a simple definition of, of geopolitics for me. Uh, risk, uh, from a business perspective, I always look at risk as the probability of an economic loss. So in this case would be, can I have an economic loss in my assets, in my future earnings, in my investment as a result of actions? by different countries to actually uh, project their power and has an economic impact on my business, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's why business people should care about geopolitical risk because it has it has an impact. Mm -hmm. M maybe the best way of actually of thinking about that is providing a few examples of, of uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, how we define, some people define geopolitical risk very, very narrowly. 
uh, almost like you know military conflict. Like for example, when Russia invaded Crimea, mm. of course you know that everyone would define that as a geopolitical event. Or what China is doing right now in the South China Sea, the aggressive actions China is taking there, or the issue between China and Taiwan. Right. So that's clearly there's a uh, there's a territorial conflict, and that's really the uh, the roots or the or the genesis of, of geopolitics. From a business perspective, we have to look at geopolitics much more broadly uh, because nations pursue or, or states pursue their national interests, of course, through a military actions, but more and more, they use other tools, whether it's economic tools, technological tools, informational tools. Uh, so really, when, when I look at, when I look at um, a geopolitical risk, I look at all of those aspects. A couple of examples would be Again, using our two favorite um, uh, geopolitical uh, examples of Russia and China, you know, what Russia does with uh, the control of their gas pipelines, mm -hmm. uh, the gas flowing into, uh, into Euro through uh, Ukraine, through uh, Belarus. I mean, that's a mechanism through which uh, Russia really uh, uh, muscles their or flexes their muscles uh, from a geopolitical perspective to really advance their, their, uh, their national interest. What China has been doing for a number of different years right now with uh, rare earth minerals. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the rare earth minerals, if we don't have those minerals, you know, we cannot be using computers, we cannot be using uh, uh, smartphones, we cannot fly on planes, we cannot have missiles, we cannot do anything in today's world. So it's it's the foundation of of the technology that we use across or, or the foundation of, the, of many of technological technological applications around the world. So China has a uh, almost a monopoly on the production of those rare earth minerals. So whenever, you know, in, in the last few years, they had a number of issues with Japan. Uh, so you can imagine if Japan cannot have access to rare earth minerals, you pretty much uh, stop the Chinese economy. Uh, they've been doing that to the US, to, to, to the EU. So really there's a number of different mechanisms through which uh, states use to advance their geopolitical interests. Uh, it's not always a, geopolitics doesn't always translate into uh, negative outcomes. You could have some, like anything else, you know, whenever there's risk, when, whenever there's risk, there's opportunity. A good example of that would be um, late last year, almost one year ago, um, the, the, uh, uh, we, had, we had Israel, the uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain sign what was called the Abraham Accord. Uh, at the time, you know, there was so much coverage in the, in the media uh, people actually, I think, uh, misinformed the uh, the uh, uh, the purpose of that, uh, whether it was for ideological purposes or, or 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 whatever the reason was. I don't think it had the the publicity it should have had because, from my perspective, when I look at that from a world perspective, was a uh, momentous occasion, was a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of relationships in the Middle East, where Israel sat at the table to negotiate with a number of Arab countries. Um, and one year after that, what we are seeing right now is a trade between Israel and many of these Arab countries has increased 300%. Okay, so I mean, it has the peace dividend has consequences. So actually, sometimes you know we tend to look at geopolitics from a uh, from a more downside. Uh, yeah, downside the risk, but also properly managed. Uh, actually, it creates it creates uh, uh, opportunities. Like you know, ask J.P. Morgan, ask. Uh, you know, uh, um, people who made money throughout history actually by capitalizing on the upside of geopolitical mm. risk. So I mean, essentially, um, we're talking about uh, the probabilities that there's going to be some kind of a um, inter-country or intergovernmental power dynamic that will somehow change the distribution of uh, potential losses or potential oh, yeah. uh, upside. Um, for uh, for firms, and they don't have to be multinational firms because even firms that are only domestic are uh, always affected by global uh, supply chains, as we've learned uh, very uh, even at the individual recently. level. Anyone yeah. who has a 401k, yes, right, <laughs> and has uh, shares in, for example, Apple. Uh, Apple is being significantly affected right now because of all the supply chain issues. So mm -hmm. it's uh, and that's why in my investment role, that's where where I look at. You know how does geopolitical risk impact um, impact mm -hmm. uh, investment? So it's at the uh, global level, multinational level, mm -hmm. um, small company level, mm -hmm. you know, personal level. So I think that geopolitics is is something that yeah. is impacting all of us. So um, if indeed um, 
the these probabilities are higher or more variable the range is now kind of uh, wider than than it was um, uh, before uh, it suggests that something has happened uh, over time that has increased geopolitical risk mm -hmm. um, uh, or made it uh, more relevant so what are some of these factors that have driven the return of geopolitical risk is it just china or what is happening china is just a uh, happens to be at the right place at the wrong time <laughs> so uh let me provide a very brief very brief historical background the history of uh, the global economy in the last 70 years okay and i say 70 years i start 1945 after the second world war uh, we had an agreement called Bretton woods that established the foundations of growth that uh, we had in most of the 20th century. Uh, in that period, uh, so, so for me, when I look at historically, there's three key dates, 1945, world, um, the end of the World War, 1989, the fall of the, uh, of the Soviet Empire, and 2008, the global financial crisis. Okay, so those are, the, uh, those are the, the anchors in which I look at the world. And each period had a different a different profile that leads to where we are today. 1945, 1849, okay, was basically the Cold War period. Okay, Geo so in all of in looking at this, I always look at two cycles: globalization and geopolitics. Mm -hmm. Those two cycles always define where the global economy stands at any point in time. Between 1945 and 1989, we had a bipolar world, the US and the Soviet Union was a very predictable world because we knew exactly what each one was going to do. Okay, while we have a confrontation, a Cold War was a very predictable environment from a business perspective, okay? And from a globalization perspective, Bretton Woods laid the foundation for a moderate, very good, healthy globalization. The, uh, the Soviet Union falls, and that's when the U.S. became the only power in the world, you know, the unipolar, it's called the uni unipolar moment, because the U.S. had was the only great power in the world, and that led the world to a what I, I use the word hyperglobalization. Hyperglobalization meaning that globalization was an end in itself, not a means to drive growth. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and that created. I mean, that was perceived at the moment like something good until then we had the 2008 crisis and we saw what happened. Right, they dro drove significant levels of inequality. Yeah. Uh, companies were way dependent on global value chains creating in one part of the world. So that was a period where there was no no geopolitical tension because mm -hmm. there was only one great power yeah. and globalization was driving the agenda. Mm -hmm. We have the global financial crisis that exposed the flaws of globalization that also showed the decline of the U.S. as, as, as a global power. It showed the uh, irrelevance of some of the, of some of the institutions created in 1945 yeah. because the IMF, the World Bank, were not able to really deal with the global financial crisis. So, and in the in the period, part of the globalization process of the uh, in 2001, we had given China access to the World Trade Organization. So that was when China started to, to rise. In two, 2008, the Chinese economy was doing extremely well. So China felt that hmm, maybe this is our moment mm -hmm. now that the rest of the world is weak to take a much more assertive position. So since 2008 to today, uh, we really have what I call a G0 world. Yeah. Okay, no one really calls the shot globally. Okay, many people say that right now we are entering in an era that's called emerging bipolarity. So China and the US are the bipolar powers, may or may not change. But what that means, Stab, is that between 1945 and 2008, anyone who uh, grew up in the business world, and by definition, most of the executives today uh, started in the workforce sometime in the, uh, in the late 80s, uh, early mm -hmm. 90s, and, and after that, grew up in a world where there was no geopolitical tension, right? Uh, because there was no need to really worry about geopolitics. You could pretty much ignore geopolitics because yeah. you know, the US was pulling the shots. Everything changed in 2008. There was a fundamental paradigm shift where all of a sudden we find ourselves in a fundamentally different world, right? Where many of the many of the assumptions, many of the uh, the mental models that worked in the in the prior period are no longer relevant, and companies all of a sudden realize that what do we do now? Can we use the old assumptions of how 
the world used to work in this new world. No, you can't, right? And that's why what I find, I have found uh, with many of my clients and many, many of the people I advise is that both companies and executives are underprepared to deal with that world because they didn't grow up. They, they never had the training on how to deal with geopolitics. I mean, as you very well know, even in, in business education, we teach economics, we teach te technology, but except for FIU and maybe a few other schools, no one teaches geopolitics, right? Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't part of the equation. So all of a sudden companies and executives found themselves in, you know, like in the Wizard of Oz when uh, Dorothy uh, says, uh, we're not in Kansas anymore, you know? <laughs> they, yeah. We're not in Kansas anymore. It's a different world and, you know, how do we, how do we make sense of this world? So that's, that's why I talk about the return of geopolitics, right? Geopolitics has been with us since the beginning of times, because as I said, it's power, conflict, it's human nature. So we lived in a, uh, in a historical research, recess or interval. Mm -hmm. We grew up in the world and we believe that that was the world that always existed. And now we realize that we're coming back to the way things have always been. And companies are not prepared properly for that. Mm. I see. So, um, so essentially it sounds to me like there are several kind of uh, parallel processes that are happening at the same time that are uh, pushing us uh, as you would say back to a bipolar world and not to a new bipolar world because um, in a sense a bipolar world was kind of the, the default from which a unipolar world has emerged and that was kind of nice and then uh, we didn't really have to uh, teach geopolitics or uh, worry about it too much. Um, I noticed that you spoke about the, um, the the rise of China, the 2008 crisis, and all of these processes um, make sense. China taking a, a stronger um, a posture um, on the geopolitical stage. Um, but I noticed that you never touched on technology, right. how the advances in um, the flows of information <clears throat> and analysis and so on um, have um, either um, enabled a more by uh, a faster move towards a bipolar world yeah. or um, have uh, essentially accelerated the extent to which geopolitical underlying geopolitical risks uh, translate into actual events actual mm -hmm. losses mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so what, what, what do you think about that actually uh, that, that that's a uh, that's a good point let's go back to the uh, to the time frame when I define 1989 end of the uh, Cold War, 2008, um, I said that the main driver of, of, of economic growth was globalization yeah. and a, a, a very geopolitically calm environment. But behind globalization was technology, okay? Because globalization basically translated into global value chains. Global value chains cannot exist unless you have technology because it's fundamentally transfer transferring not just people and, and, and products, but transferring data and yeah. information flows around the world. Mm -hmm. And that, that was made possible because precisely because of the U.S. was the unipolar power, the Internet was created with common standards. Mm -hmm. So globalization requires common standards, mm -hmm. okay? Whether it's economic standards, financial standards, accounting standards, technology standards were created fundamentally by the U.S. by enabling the, uh, the Internet and the whole world actually benefited from that. Mm -hmm. So that was the main driver, right? What we see right now, so, so technology was a, an enabler of the globalization, of the globalization process. Okay? You could say it's a, uh, it's a two-sided coin, coin. On one side you have globalization, on the other side you have, you have technology. Now what's happening now, and really this has been happening since 2008, as China becomes much more, much, much more assertive, China also because of the, uh, their, their need for political control from the Chinese Communist Party, they don't like an open internet, right? Yeah. So, so when you look at, you know, the the firewall and all the uh, all the technological implications of how, how China manages their their technologies, what we're seeing today, you may have heard the word uh, decoupling. Uh, it's nothing else than really the internet fragmentation. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I believe that the world will become at least two major technology camps. The U.S. and I think the EU is moving more and more closer to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Chinese uh, technology platforms, uh, and that's part of when China advances uh, the uh, what's called the Belt and Road Initiative, 
um, of, of creating infrastructure around the world, one of the conditions that China imposes is, okay, to do that, you have to use my technology band, my, my technology platforms. Okay, that's where Huawei plays a major role in the process. Mm -hmm. So what that creates is, and that's why, you know, globalization will never return the way that you and I grew up with, with mm -hmm. globalization. Why? Because uh, clearly you see a fragmentation of the value chains. Mm -hmm. You see fundamentally a fragmentation of technology, a decoupling of technology that will, and that's why it's called the split, the, the splinter net. Mm -hmm. The internet will split mm -hmm. into a two major camps. And that's where, when we hear the, uh, the, uh, the US-China rivalry around technology, whether it's 5G, whether it's artificial intelligence, it's all around that concept. He who controls digital technologies will have a major impact on controlling the global economy in the world. So that's where, where the, uh, and that's why I said before, when you look at geopolitics, uh, and that's why actually we use different words today. We use geopolitics, geoeconomics, and geotechnology, right? Yeah. What are the geopolitical implications of technological moves that enable a country to advance its power and its national interest around the world? Okay. Well, let me play devil's advocate here for a second. So um, you talked about cycles and the notion of cycles suggests that everything is transitory. How long the transition takes is uh, debatable, but building on that notion, um, there's some research out there that indicates that um, even though um, it's significant, China's uh, military power or economic power is nowhere near uh, the power of the uh, United States. Um, in terms of their technological abilities, they might be good at a few certain things. So where I'm, what I'm going towards is that a devil's advocate position might be, this will blow away very quickly. Um, there is a little bit of increase in geopolitical risk now. We're in a period of slightly elevated geopolitical risk, but eventually, uh, China will not be able to get to a position where uh, there is a proper bifurcation of um, business and technological ecosystems in the world. In other words, this is a short-term phenomenon, not a long-term reality. What do you say to this? I completely disagree with that. Uh, basically, I think that this is not, and that's why I'm, 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 I'm calling this the return of geopolitics, not the temporary return of geopolitics. We are going back to where we have been throughout our lives. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, I think there's a, uh, I'm not saying that this will, ne will never return, right? But when I look at the next 20, 30 years, which is a fairly long time frame, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are going through a fundamental shifts in economics in geopolitics and in technology all at the same time mm -hmm. okay this is like i always say you know when people you see an earthquake but the earthquake occurs because there are tectonic plates which are moving very slowly mm -hmm. over decades and eventually they come together right well we are at the point where different tectonic plates that have been moving very slowly in globalization in technology in geopolitics are coming together when and where the earthquake is going to occur you never know mm -hmm. right but the faults are there, mm -hmm. right? And so, so what, I, what I'm saying is that, in my opinion, these are structural faults in the, in, in, in the global economy, in the way the world is working, that are not going to uh, disappear for, for, for a while. Um, and what happens is, you know, in periods of transitions, and transitions create uncertainty, create mm -hmm. complexity, and you want to because of our business nature, we really want to get an answer. Because our human nature, we, you really want to get an answer. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, our answer is driven by wishful thinking, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the uh, the single most important thing that people in business, I always tell them, uh, when it comes to geopolitics, you cannot be naive. Because you know, in 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 geopolitics, in business in general, being naive, you pay a price for that, right? So my personal view is this is here to stay with us for, for, for a while because the underlying foundations upon which the global economy rests are all in a, in, in a period of, of, of transition. Mm -hmm. And that's why, as I said before, many companies feel unprepared. Mm -hmm. And that's what you hear from many executives that they are actually not, they may understand intellectually, but so what do we do? How do we really 
deal with the problem. Mm. Okay, so uh, that's actually a good uh, transition to uh, what I was going to um, bring up next. Um, so there was a uh, 2019 survey of executives in Fortune 1000 firms, um, and what the survey showed is that only 14%, one four, uh, one four, uh, felt that their company was well prepared to manage geopolitical uh, risk. Why, why do you think that is? What, what makes it so difficult uh, to manage compared to other risks? Uh, I, I mean, I think that's fairly, fairly. Um, I mean, based on my experience dealing with with many global companies, multinational companies, and we're dealing with multinational companies, right? Mm -hmm. That supposedly know how to handle these things. Uh, that's a fair, fairly, uh, fairly good um, assessment. And, and, and you said they're not prepared to actually deal with it, right? Yes. I mean, so they may understand it intellectually, yes. but okay, yes. so what do we do? And, and the reason why I think that may be the case is that geopolitical risk is like a unicorn, okay? You don't know exactly what type of animal it is. And it has a number of different features that make it very unique. No, number one, the nature of geopolitical risk. What, what is risk? Risk is nothing else than the probability of an of an event occurring mm -hmm. times the impact it may have on your business, right? Mm -hmm. Geopolitical risk, both the probability tends to be fairly uncertain and the impact is going to be fairly uncertain. Let's take the, uh, the case of, uh, of uh, China and Taiwan. Uh, as, as you may know, one of the main concerns in the global economy today is what will China do with Taiwan? Will they take over Taiwan? Uh, will the U.S. come to the rescue of Taiwan? Will the uh, the West will come to the rescue of Taiwan? Will that deal to a uh, World War III uh, uh, event? Mm. And the issue there is how do you quantify the uh, geopolitical risk of that scenario? Okay, when Taiwan is in Taiwan, we, Taiwan manufactures over sixty percent. Of the uh, of the chip. semiconductor the the the, 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 the semiconductor chips in the yeah. world sixty percent okay in one country mm -hmm. one tiny island yeah so China takes over Taiwan and China controls technology for everyone in the world so how do you quantify that across all the countries in the world across all the industries so one of the one of the things is that people don't know how to traditionally in business we say well there is a sixty percent probability that um, you know this machine will not be working five years from now. Based on that, I calculate depreciation, I, I reserve right. money, blah, blah, blah. That's the way we've all been trained to, to deal with business. In geopolitics, you can't, because you cannot even assign a realistic probability to that, right? So that's one of them. The other one is the nature of the risk is we were trained to think of you know, international business. If you have a plant in Poland, you look at what are the risks that that plant may deal with uh, you know uh, uh, civil unrest you know uh, labor force uh, um, issues because i mean you usually look at the risk from the country where you have operations geopolitical risk doesn't work that way because you may not have operations in the country but precisely be because of the extension of the global value chains and that's what we're seeing right now in the supply chain world yeah. you may be impacted a few years ago uh, there was a, a major event in the South China Sea between China and Vietnam, where China actually uh, uh, took possession of a couple of uh, Vietnamese vessels, ships, and there was uh, massive anti-Chinese demonstrations in, uh, in, uh, in Vietnam. As a result of that, one of the main manufacturers of clothing for companies like you know, Walmart, like mm. Target, like Nike, uh, was closed for uh, almost a month. Mm. in the month of October, okay? So Nike, Walmart, uh, Target did not have the Christmas clothing that they were planning to have mm. for Christmas. They had no operations whatsoever in Vietnam, so they have never looked at Vietnam as a potential country. So as a potential country for geopolitical. So actually there, there's a number of different factors that make it very difficult to, uh, to understand, make it very difficult to assess. And that is at the bottom of how many people have struggle when it comes to actually to actually uh, uh, managing managing geopolitical risk mm -hmm. organizational processes don't help 
Um, many people in business do not have the right geopolitical education, the right geopolitical yeah. background. Um, therefore, you know, when when they may have a strategic planning session, they look at the strategy mm. and they think of risk after the strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's why many companies build these global value chains, global supply chains that depend 100% on on, uh, on on China, like the pharma industry, right? Because you thought of risk after the fact. In today's world, you cannot do it that way. I mean, you, strategy and risk go hand in hand. So any properly done strategic thinking process has to be iterative. Yeah. Think of the strategy, where are the risks? Do the risk imply that I have to change my strategy? So that, that's that's fundamentally different from how most companies run their, their 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 strategy and their thinking processes. So there's a number of different factors, and I mean, I I, I could go on forever, but I want to just give you a few examples with 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 real life implications of what has happened that made companies actually um, make, makes it very difficult for them to change their organizational structure, to change their mm -hmm. yeah. strategic planning, their processes, their executives' mindset. So that's that's one of the reasons why it doesn't surprise me that only 14% of companies feel that they have the right the right tools and the right information to actually do it properly. Yes. Well, at least uh, it's a good start that there is a certain awareness that they yes. that, that they are not um, well equipped to to handle it, and that it is it is different uh, from some of the other ones. I think um, it's in in essence, uh, what you said is that there are second order and third order and fourth order effects right. that um, either uh, we haven't thought of, or that are just very difficult to foresee because mm -hmm. um, the you know even in the case of of Taiwan, there are so many scenarios that could right. happen. One scenario yeah. is that uh, we actually go in there and, and there's war. The other one is that something else happens, um, and so on. So we have that. And then the other issue that doesn't make it better is that uh, with other uh, more well-known and um, uh, specialized forms of risk. There is there are typically people around who know it and from whom you can draw right. expertise. But when it comes to geopolitical risk, um, uh, these uh, experts or specialists from whom you can draw expertise and knowledge are far and few between because like you said, for a very long period of time, there was essentially no incentive right. uh, to, uh, to be the geopolitics right. person, the go-to person, right? And, and actually that's, that's... You know, one of the things when when I had to do it for for, for PwC that um, I, I made sure that our process did not rely exclusively on, on the opinion of one person or one company, mm -hmm. and and the reason is going back to uh, this simultaneous transition of multiple paradigm shifts in economics and technology. Why are experts experts? Because they know what happened in the past and they can extrapolate the past to the present, Historians. right? When conditions change, experts look like fools. Mm -hmm. Think about Brexit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I remember during the uh, during the uh, um, the sovereign debt crisis in 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 Greece in 2014, yeah. some of uh, the uh, famed Nobel Prize winners uh, in economics say, you know, here's what we need to do. Here's what Greece has to do uh, because of A, B, and C, and that's exactly the opposite of what had to be done and what the Greek people actually decided to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it was it was counter. So experts, when when the conditions change, experts are very dangerous because they rely on past medicine, on past tools that no are no may no longer be relevant to the uh, to the situation. In case, also experts tend to talk to each other. A good example that I live that I was born in Argentina. And so people always come to me for advice on on the Argentine economy, which I never give because it's impossible to predict. <laughs> but in Argentina in 2015, uh, Macri became president. He is a uh, you know um, business person, kind of a center right. He tried to change the country in the midterm elections in 2017. Um, he actually uh, he actually uh, gained a majority in Congress. So all the conditions were. Argentina is finally moving in the right direction, right? So in 2017, Argentina actually issued 100 year, 100 year sovereign bonds, okay? Uh, a country with the history of Argentina, you know, um, yeah. I didn't buy, 
yeah. and many of my friends, you know, in, in, in Wall Street, uh, were saying, oh, no, we need, we, need to, we need to buy, we need to make those investments. And I asked them why. Well, we talk to people in the government, we talk to our geopolitical experts, you know, who know and, and who talk to each other and who talk to the people in the government. So it's, it's, a, very, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very close circle where every, they all talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? If you look at one of the things in geopolitics is you have to look broader, the context. Okay, in 2017, you already saw Argentina was the 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 levels of poverty were increasing. Mm. Uh, the currency continued um, um, the 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 down trend in terms of value. Inflation was rising, so the conditions were not for Argentina to issue sovereign bonds. Many investors did because they relied on the experts who happened to know better. Mm. And what happened? They lost their money. So that's why I always warn my clients. In times like this, um, of course, you know you need to talk to people, but talk to as many people as possible, get different points of view, and then make your own decisions based on multiple sources of information. So, I mean, speaking of um, figuring things out um, in in the face of geopolitical risk, so you um, were in charge of PwC's global strategy for a while. Um, and uh, you were supposed to manage the firm's geopolitical risk. Uh, PwC operates in more than 150 countries or so. Um, what are kind of briefly, what are some of the strategies that you implemented there? Well, the, the first one was the, the one I just shared before. We, we, we did not, we, we had many firms out there from which we, uh, we uh, received uh, advisory services and we made our own decisions. Mm. Then we actually, it's extremely important to create the right intelligence gathering process, right? Many multinational firms rely on a few experts in New York, in Frankfurt, in London, who don't know the reality of Vietnam, of Ethiopia, yeah. or Mexico, right? So what we did is we actually bifurcated our intelligence gathering process. Um, we created country intelligence units where that was the bottom-up process. Mm -hmm. We all use the same tools, the same frameworks, but I had people living in Mexico, in Ethiopia, and um, I can recall the other example I gave before in terms of the country to actually provide what's happening in that country. At the same time, we had a central team looking at major global trends, major macro trends, because usually geopolitics occurs at the intersection of major global trends and country-specific yeah. issues. So the, the way that you structure your intelligence gathering process is extremely important. We used scenarios. Uh, scenario thinking very aggressively because you know when you have uncertainty and you don't know what the future may look may look like i always say you know, you cannot think of the future think of futures mm -hmm. and prepare yourself for multiple futures we actually created a very you know the equivalent of the global supply chain for a firm like pwc or any knowledge firm is a global value chain yeah. where you have delivery centers knowledge centers all over the world Many of the firms in our industry just went to India and had all the operations in India. We created redundancy. It was a bit more expensive, yes. Um, by redundancies, we had operations in India, in China, in the Philippines, in you know, Uruguay, in Mexico, in Morocco. And by doing that, we created some buffers. So whenever you had any issue in one country, you could use the other country. That became, for example, extremely relevant for PwC during the pandemic. Uh, they could use different elements of the uh, of the um, um, of the global value chain to actually uh, drive the process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what you see today. Many of the issues we have with, with global supply chains is that we're relying, companies were relying on one country mm -hmm. or one provider or, um, you know, very, very concentrated, very concentrated sources of, of, of supply. And you're seeing that companies are looking at how do I diversify my, 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 my base of suppliers. And then the other thing that was extremely important for us was when you look at the future, it's not just thinking of what the geopolitical risks could be, by identifying some key performance metrics that you can follow, right? What I call signposts um, that tells you, look, if you see this sign, it's an indication that things may go down in India in the artificial intelligence field, mm -hmm. or things may go wrong in uh, in Mexico when it comes to the uh, to the uh, um, relationship between between uh, the government and and, 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 and 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 private entities. So creating some key performance metrics that you can look at regularly 
some companies do it, but they do it once a year, mm -hmm. right? So uh, this is something that the world changes daily. Yeah. So especially in today's world with the uh, with the wealth of data and analytics that we have, I think that um, uh, the the right approach is really to create a dashboard that enables you to pretty much monitor the evolution of key key signposts mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So that's that's really a number of the uh, we did many other things, but you know those are some of the things that may be relevant for other people that um, actually operate in, in in similar industries. So I think uh, we have about 15 minutes or so left. So I think we can um, maybe um, pick up a few questions from the audience. Um, I mean, we have more stuff that we can talk about yeah. all day, but uh, we we haven't even started yet. But um, I I do want to. Um, um, get back to some people in mm -hmm. terms of uh, some of the burning questions. Um, so um, let's see. Um, so how do you determine in terms of geopolitical forecasts, right? How do you determine the ones that are good, the ones that are uh, not so good and you want to stay away from? So in, in essence, I think this is a question not at the firm level, but more so yes. for the executives, our, our audience is executive. So, um, you know, if you are an executive who wants to be geopolitically informed or geopolitically savvy, yeah. how do you uh, differentiate between what is the real deal and what is just... Yeah, or maybe an extrapolation of the past based on right. The, the... Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a very... Whoever has that question shows that, you know, that it's good. You're, you're seeing that, mm -hmm. that executives are already moving in the right direction in terms of... Uh, broadening their their intellectual their their geopolitical acumen so a couple of things i always look at is as i said before use as many sources of, as possible okay don't rely just on one uh source and in any analysis that i i, I can tell you what i used to do right the first thing i looked at is does the analysis give me a point in the future which is the way that traditionally experts tend to do things, like saying, oh, there's a 60% chance that this will occur. Well, really, that doesn't do anything for me, right? So for me, a good geopolitical analysis gives you a, a, a range of options that may occur mm -hmm. and gives you, you know, what are the conditions that may lead to one situation or the other. Mm -hmm. When you deal with uncertainty, by definition, you don't know what's going to happen. So being well informed implies understanding the range of potential options. I mean, I'm not saying that you look at 25 different options, but usually, you know, having two or three different scenarios and what are the drivers, the drivers behind those scenarios. The other, the other factor that uh, I think it's important is that the analysis that you receive takes into account the context. And by context, I mean, for example, history, right? Uh, what things have changed in the past? Let me give you an example. When you look at what Russia does, right? People get obsessed with Putin. Putin did this, Putin did that. Putin is not doing anything different from what Peter the Great mm. did 300 years ago, okay? Yeah. Because Russia has a geopolitical reality, which is its geography, okay? So whatever he does in Ukraine, in Belarus, is just a consequence of Russia's geopolitical position. So understanding that context is something that, that usually is, is um, is very relevant, and the other, the other the other warning sign I look for, Stav, is I look for ideological bias, which is very dangerous yeah. in today's world, that's, right? That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> uh, because we all have a point of view, and we all have an ideology about many mm -hmm. things, right? I believe that when you provide advice to a company, you need to put that aside, and you need to say, here is why some things may happen, why some things may not happen. The example I gave at the very beginning of our conversation about the Abraham Accords, I believe that on it, my personal view is that the media, for whatever reason, decided not to uh, not to promote that the way it should have been promoted, and many people missed business opportunity, right? So so that's, that's the other thing I, I look for, uh, and when you get to know the consulting firm that you're working with, the advisory firm that you're working with, you may know where they come from, and if you think that you have a certain ideology, look for a position on the opposite side. So you can contrast and confront that as part of that, you know, multi, 
uh, a sourced approach to uh, to gathering geopolitical intelligence. Mm. Um, there is a, a very good question here about our institutions um, that uh, I think uh, we kind of alluded to, uh -huh. but I think it's it's good to make it more explicit. The question is, um, our institutions are they prepared to deal with a world that is um, bifurcated, that mm -hmm. is bipolar, um, and that um, at the same time has these tremendous technological advancements. Uh, Does it say here whether the institutions were referring to multilateral institutions? Well, I would say um, let's address it on two levels, the uh -huh. multilateral level and yes. the US level. Okay, okay. Uh, certainly at the multilateral level, the multilateral institutions are by that, let's make sure we all use the, uh, the same language. When we talk about multilateral institutions, I am talking about the uh, United Nations, the World Bank, the, uh, the uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Health Organization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is an unequivocal no. Mm. They're not prepared at all right. uh, for a simple reason. Those institutions were created 75 years ago for a fundamentally different world. They had a great mission that they accomplished. They rebuilt the world after the Second World yeah. War. But I don't see many people using technology from 1945 when it comes to computers. Why are we using the same multilateral architecture to deal with problems which are fundamentally different and the world which is fundamentally different because today we live in it we like it or not but we live in a very highly connected interconnected world so the problems cannot be solved with the tools that we created in the past that's one of the reasons why china for example is trying to create its own multilateral institutions like right. the asian investment and infrastructure bank yeah. right i mean that's they say the imf really doesn't help us the World Bank doesn't help us. We will create our own bank, our, our, our own bank, and we will actually, um, actually, uh, 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 you know, decide, call the shots on how to fund our projects. Yeah. So that's at the uh, multilateral level. At the uh, U.S. level, boy. Uh, <laughs> so that's let a topic me, for an entirely entire webinar in itself. So uh, <laughs> let me let me address one positive side and one negative one okay mm -hmm. so it's, it's a, it's a okay. balanced view what i see positive is i believe that irrespective uh, we all know that that the country is highly polarized and divided there's one area and i've, I've, I've done some work for the uh for the uh, uh senate committee on foreign relations so uh, i i can tell you this firsthand uh both sides of the aisle look at the china threat with a common view which is very good because we need that. Okay, we can't afford. I mean, in my opinion, it's a real threat, right? Um, and I believe that you know that's maybe maybe one of the very few areas where we have some commonalities mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, in terms of advancing the the U.S. agenda. Do they know what to do? That's a different question. Okay, um, but at least we have a common understanding of the threat and a common intention to tackle the threat. Okay. Then you can be more or less effective as to how you do it. So that's one area. The area in the U.S. where we are falling, we have fallen behind, and we continue falling behind daily, is um, the ability of uh, our institutions and our regulatory system, our laws, to deal with digital technologies. Mm. Okay. Now, and, and that's why you know all the things that you hear about the big tech power, the monopoly power of the Facebooks, of the Googles. Um, we don't know how to deal with that, or Congress doesn't know how to deal with that, or institutions don't know how to deal with that. However, that is not a unique situation. That has happened throughout history. Regulation always lagged at least a decade behind a technological advances. Okay, I mean, when, and, and that's why when, when you hear the way that many people in Congress, I, I was watching some of the uh, some of the uh, um, hearings with Facebook and Google, and the questions that 
that members of the Senate ask are based on thinking from 1910, okay, when we created the, uh, the antitrust laws in the U.S. You cannot apply antitrust laws that were applicable to Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan yeah. to Facebook. So, so that's one area where our institutions are, in my opinion, not just in the U.S., but the, the EU is equally bad. Uh, our institutions in the West are lagging behind tremendously, and that's an area where China has an advantage over us. Because China is top down. Okay, the, the, yeah. the Chinese Communist Party decides how to manage those companies, many of whom are state owned companies, yeah. right? Uh, so that's where I think that going back to that, this aspect of geotechnology, there will be a big confrontation between the market driven approach that is typical of the US mm. to the state driven approach uh, from, from, from China. I think that the answer should be somewhere in the middle, honestly. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, kind of combine a few questions together yeah. around uh, a certain theme. Um, so I, this again revolves around the issue of, of, of China, but uh, the, the questions that I see here are essentially, um, are we going into um, kind of a phase where the US-China tension is the defining geopolitical risk uh, for the next 20, 30 years or so, um, and um, or um, do you see China as being a, a geopolitical force and there's some tension, but in essence, uh, the major events that are going to create disruption and problems for multinational companies are actually more likely to come from elsewhere, which perhaps might be a derivative of the rise of China, um, but still not directly China itself. So is it the direct US-China tension or is it other things that we might be missing? Is it Ethiopia? Is it so, right? Uh, is it just that we have this kind of global environment where geopolitics are just, <clears throat> geopolitical tensions are more elevated everywhere and so, um, in 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 a sense, the U.S. and China kind of cancel right. each other out. But then, in other places that you're not looking at, that's where things are likely to blow up. So clearly, geopolitical tensions are rising up everywhere. If you live in Ukraine, your number one geopolitical tension is Ukraine in the middle between Russia and the EU. Right. So of course, geopolitical risk is always very localized. But if I look at that from a global level, um, you know, it's it's impossible to say what's going to happen in 20 years. So the best thing is always to look at history. Mm. Every time in history where a major power was challenged by a new power, mm -hmm. there was tension. Okay. It goes back to Athens and Sparta. Okay. I'm not talking about just last year. It goes yeah. in history. Yeah. Anyone who's interested in looking at this at this aspect, there's a phenomenal book called The, uh, the uh, Thucydides Trap by Alison Graham that actually looks at all the events in history where to a, 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 an established power was challenged by an up and coming power. I believe that the rivalry between the US and China is the defining conflict uh, for the next, again, 20, 30 years. The reason I say that is China's challenge is not just economic. Mm -hmm. It's economic, it's military, it's technological, it's diplomatic, it's informational. So China is using every single uh, tool of statecraft yeah. to really change the conditions of, 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 of the world order. And it's important, I, I said before, understanding history, understanding context. It's understanding how the Chinese people think or the Chinese culture. For China, what has happened in the last 100 years is an anomaly because in the Chinese culture, in the Chinese mindset, China has, for most of history, has always been the number one power in the world. Mm. Okay, we live in a, in, a, in a world where the West really uh, was able to control most, much of the shots for the last for the last for the last century. Uh, the Chinese actually referred to that as the century of humiliation because they lost wars uh, to the Brits, uh, to Japan. Uh, they were always on the losing side of uh, of um, um, conflict. of conflict. 
So China believes that regaining control of the world is about, it's their essence. Mm. So it's not something that they just want to do because now all of a sudden uh, they are powerful and they're economically uh, uh, prosperous because they think that is the place in the world. In, in, in the Chinese culture, it's conceived that, that's what it's called the middle kingdom. Actually, the, mini, the, the meaning of the middle kingdom is China is what sits between the celestial powers and humankind. Mm. So China believes that the role, they, they, they don't conceive a world order, which is not a Chinese world order. Mm -hmm. That is very different from what the Soviet Union believed. So when many, many people compare this to the Cold War, it's fundamentally different because this is embedded in how the Chinese culture thinks. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking I'm about the Chinese people itself, but you know, and, and that's pretty much the driver of the Chinese Communist Party. And again, they're using every single tool available to them to advance their national interest. So I think it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know, when I hear sometimes the uh, people in the U.S. government saying, we don't want to compete with China, so we want to collaborate. It's not whether you want to compete with China or not. Mm -hmm. if they want to compete with you. So if someone wants to compete with you, you have to respond that way. Mm -hmm. That's why, as I said before, I think that what I see in the uh, U.S. Senate, especially, where uh, both sides of the aisle understand the nature of the challenge and the, and the nature of the tension is, is, is healthy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we already have a clear answer on how to deal with that. And the big question mark is what hap happens with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Because all of this could be, everything I just described could be resolved peacefully. It doesn't mean that it will be war. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is, in my opinion, the one uh, factor that may trigger a military confrontation that will have devastating consequences mm -hmm. for the world. So I think that's, that's, that's one thing that, for me, if you think me, one major risk is Taiwan. That's the one. Um, so I, we're sliding yeah. a little bit over time, but, but we can perhaps do just one more question. Okay. Um, there was one interesting question um, along the lines of, if I want to understand geopolitical risk or assess geopolitical risk, what should I be monitoring, right? And I'd like to translate that into, that into a slightly broader question. If you are an, an executive who wants to be um, geopolitically informed, um, knowing how, how do you do activities that allow you to monitor what is happening? And by activities, I mean, what do you read? What do you listen to? Uh, and, and so on. How do you design your knowledge flow portfolio in a way? Um, uh, you know, you know, in a way that is, um, that has good right. quality and hygiene. Let's, yeah. let's put it this way, that then allows you to monitor the right stuff so that you can, on the one hand, understand what is going on with the systemic uh, geopolitical risk coming from China, but also understand that there are other more localized events that could significantly affect your career or your business or, or, or whatever. I mean, actually, that's something, going back to some of the things I, I did at PwC, mm -hmm. I felt that you used the word awareness before. Uh, I think that the uh, number one step of moving a company forward is creating awareness at the executive level. So, for example, I had I created a geopolitical education program mm. for the leadership team and for the board. Okay, I, that's what I do today with, with with a few companies. So, I think that the, the field of this field is so broad yeah. that you can be reading many things and studying many things. So, the, usually, what I do is. I try to understand for, for a company, you know, what are the key areas of the world that, that they need to monitor. Uh, there's a wealth of information out there that is very relevant. Personally, I tend to, uh, to look at the, uh, the uh, uh, reports from different think tanks, mm -hmm. you know, places like the uh, Hoover uh, Institution, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Hudson Institute, Rand Corporation, uh, Brookings Institution. And actually, I just named a few that are on different sides of the ideological Eurasia aisle. also. Eurasia, Eurasia, yeah. Eurasia. But, but the risk with a firm like Eurasia, I'm, I am not singling out on them, yeah. is that a consulting firm, like an insurance company that provides geopolitical advice, yeah. they will not sell insurance. Yeah. A geopolitical firm, with, uh, right. So you need to understand well, their vested interest. Sure. So yeah. that, I, I am not saying that think tanks have, do not have vested interests, but. <clears throat> Um, 
usually has been a very useful source of information I have used with executives. Uh, I tend to, I believe that you cannot do this with a, a broad brush. You have to uh, to manage that in manageable chunks that ex executives are, are very busy, yeah. okay? What I tell you for sure is do not rely on what you see on Facebook, on, on Twitter, okay? That is the last thing that you, that, that you want to rely on. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has, is in my opinion, of the uh, of the uh, um, uh, of the different newspapers there is the best one. The uh, the Wall Street Journal has every Monday night if you do it online, every Tuesday if you read the paper, a an international column by Walter Russell Mead, which I always say it's a must. Clearly, uh, uh, when when I teach this in at, you know at FIU, it's a must that all my students have to uh, have, have have to read. So slowly you start. You know, reading someone like like Mead gives you a pretty good perspective. You know, uh, is Ukraine an issue? Is China an issue? Is yeah. Russia? So really starting at at the, at the high level, developing a good understanding, and then delving deeper into uh, company specific issues that are relevant to your business. Mm -hmm. I think that's, and I presume also speaking to others who are also uh, either um, uh, are. Kind of delving deep into this issue or themselves seeking to understand this issue and are in, engaged in a process right. of search um and then uh, like you said earlier uh you talk to people broadly and then you form your own opinion right so in the same way you <clears throat> read broadly and you talk to people broadly and you formulate your knowledge portfolio uh in, in a similar way uh, geopolitics is about connecting the dots yeah. right uh connecting the dots you know you need to have some understanding of history of geography that's what's geo mm -hmm. right uh, of economics of technology and, and so that's why really uh getting to the uh to to an opinion to a point of view requires looking at different sources different different disciplines to bring together everything into a a point of view that makes sense for your company for your institution for your for your organization okay uh so i, I think we're uh, we're, we're out of time so miriana are you gonna take it from here Yes, yes, I would really like to thank you so much, Stav and Edgardo. It, it, we truly appreciate the opportunity to have you present for, for IV Exec audience. Thanks so much for, for a wonderful presentation. And, and I would also like to thank uh, you all for joining us today. We will make sure to share the recording of the webinar in the coming days. And I wish you all a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you.